good afternoon uh, to the second session of the Unmove workshop. It's uh, my great uh, honor to present the, this year's keynote speaker, Professor Misra from Singapore Management University, where he's a professor and also the vice dean. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Professor Misra. All right, shall I begin? Yes. Well, so good afternoon, everybody, and um, thank you for showing up in such large numbers. Um, I have to say this is the first time I'm giving a talk with two characteristics. Um, well, once I'm being videotaped, so I have to be very careful what I say, otherwise 20 years from now, you know, somebody's gonna dig this video out on YouTube and then embarrass me in some way. But more importantly, it seems like we are have like, you know, it's like parliament, you have like a, a, one party on this side and another party on the other side. So if one of you is like particularly hostile and unkind to me, the other party's gonna support me. Okay, that's, that's the uh, arrangement that we agreed to. So once again, uh, welcome. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about something that I usually do not talk about. Um, I'll give you a little background about my research interests very shortly. But as you'll see, the topic on which I'm talking today in this OnMove workshop, it is about the ability to take vehicular data and apply analytics on it to discover various events going on in a city. So this is not a talk about vehicular networks. It's not about the networking protocol. It's not about bandits. It's not about the communication protocols, et cetera, which a lot of the workshop is about. So it's a little bit different. It's about when cities begin to collect large traces of vehicular data, which is essentially some kind of mobility trace. What can you begin to do after you collect such mobility traces? That's the focus of my talk. I want to acknowledge that this is actually done with, uh, at one point, uh, one of our postdoc students, Lu Yu, who's a professor now in China, uh, with my PhD student, Kasturi, and our research engineers, Noel and Andrew, um, all who are over here at SMU. Um, and also this work is, um, just so you understand, in particular, I wanted to mention this, a lot of this work is funded by, there's two sources for this. One is called the Living Analytics Research Center, which is a center we have funded by the National Research Foundation over in Singapore. In joint, it's a partnership with Carnegie Mellon. So it's CMU and SMU together. We run this research center here, which is looking at all sorts of smart nation analytics. It's also funded by ITC PAC, which happens to be a research, public research arm of like the US Defense Department. And you might find that strange, saying why are they funding this kind of research, but this is basic research that focuses on understanding properties of cities. So this feeds a lot into um, theories of urban science and network science, for example. So without further ado, uh, I wanted to start off by saying these are vehicular networks and people were talking about smart vehicles. So here's what I think of smart vehicles. So this is the future. Can any of you actually answer this question? The next time you get pulled over and the cop comes over and you both have smart cars, and the cop has no idea why he pulled you over. So he's asking you, do you have any idea why my car pulled you over? So the cars can become smarter than people. And I also wanted to show another cartoon, which is you know, the future of smart cars. It'll take you to places where you don't want to go. In this case, the library. Now, I don't work in any of this, thankfully. And this is the reason I chose not to work on it, because I don't want to be directed to where I want to go. Uh, so here are my core research interests, and I broke it down into three parts. Some of you know me from the past. You notice that my most dominant piece of work is actually around mobile wearable sensing and analytics. So that relates to things like how to use a smartwatch or a smartphone to capture you know, how much food you eat or what are you browsing in a store, for example. So all of the pieces of what is a human being doing in the physical world? What are they interacting with? What actions are they taking? So on. As you'll see, I'll be connecting it to this theme of combining it with vehicular data to detect urban events. And you'll see some examples of that shortly. Um, another big piece of work that I do in Singapore, and we've been doing for a while now, for over four years, is around urban mobile crowdsourcing, which I'm not going to talk about today. This is the piece of work where you have a bunch of workers going around the city, and how do you incentivize them? How do you recommend tasks to them so that they perform a variety of location-sensitive tasks? So these tasks could be like checking the you know, if a parking garage uh, sort of gantry is working or not, or what is the, you know, if a particular trees have been cut, are there potholes on a certain segment of the street, et cetera. 
So the whole idea around that, and I'll conclude on that note, you know, you hear a lot about smart cities and things like that, and since you, a lot of you are coming to Singapore, um, I just want to sort of expand the view that some of you may have that smart cities are all about infrastructure. It's all about putting sensors on you know, this and that, and on water hydrants and sensors on parking garages. I believe a very important piece of a smart city is the ability to sensorize, if you will, if I can use that verb, to, to activate as sensors and actuators human beings, the participants, the residents of the city. So there's a big effort around that, which is sort of the soft side of sensing. How do you involve human beings in offering services around the city? I won't talk about that today. We can discuss that after offline. And finally, the piece which I will talk about today is the sociophysical analytics piece, which is the ability to combine social media data Combine physical data, physical data meaning the data from people's smartphones and smartwatches, as well as data that the government is aggregating and releasing, which is about mobility traces of buses, cars, taxis, etc. How do we combine that to answer some interesting questions? So that's the overall theme of the talk. So here are some statistics on um, on Singapore data. Now it's a large city; it's not as humongous as some of the other cities. Uh, um, in some cases, the mobility here is quite different than the mobility in other cities. So um, just on last Friday, I was in Jakarta, which is uh, only an hour's flight from here. And what was interesting was I, I, I from the central business district to the airport, uh, my traveling time was over four and a half hours. And after that, I spent you know an hour on the flight and then 30 minutes in check-in. So it's interesting. So you see that transportation here means something quite different. So we have approximately 550,000 cars in Singapore. Um, if you can, you don't have to look at all the specific numbers over here, but one of the interesting things you'll see is that the total kilometers driven by cars is actually decreasing in Singapore. This is a trend unlike most cities, especially if you come from Asia, you see that you know, car usage is growing up. In Singapore, car usage is actually going down. Um, the second thing is we have large number of buses in these statistics. There's about 4 million rides every day. This is a population is about 5.2 million, 5.5 million roughly. Um, so you can see that a lot of people take buses every day. And there's one million kilometers of distance covered by buses every day when you do the aggregate of how many trips they cover. And finally, the thing that has been growing up, you know, why are cars coming down? It's because taxis and private hires, so this is the private car hire market, which has now exceeded the number of taxis. The taxis have actually started to come down in Singapore. So this is the Ubers, the Grabs of the world that have been going up. So one of the phenomena that is going on in Singapore right now is people are gradually abandoning cars, and they're moving to sort of the shared private hire type of transportation. Um, and I, I, I want to make this statement not because I'm, I am an outlier, but some of you may find it unbelievable. The, the fact is that you know I moved to Singapore seven years ago from the US, and everybody told me oh, the first thing you're gonna do is go buy a car, because that's what you're used to. Even after seven years, I have never owned a car in Singapore. I still do not own a car. So I take public transportation every day, which is, I would say, uncommon for large swaths of society at a certain socioeconomic demographic. Now, all of this, is to say that we actually have data. If you're a private car, then of course you can't really track it. You don't know what, where it's going, et cetera. The moment you rely, begin to rely on public transportation and the dominance of public transportation, then this is a data set that the public agencies, these are run by companies. So these are data sets that you can potentially begin to collect and harvest. Because you know every bus, Wherever it's going, how many people are getting on the bus, getting off the bus. Every taxi, where it's the trip originates, where the destination ends, all of this data is being collected and being shared with us in real time. So there, it opens up some interesting possibilities of various kinds of analytics. So I was talking about mobile and wearable sensing. Now, again, I'm not going to get into the details. And also, by the way, just in case this part of the audience is wondering why I'm staying away from you, it's because I've been geofenced Apparently, if I cross this line, the video won't be able to track me. So I'm going to interact with you like this. It's not because I don't want to go over. Um, but what is happening is, so I just listed out some projects. So we've been able to do queuing detection. So the idea is that you know, if anybody has a smartphone or a watch, which we really haven't done, but theoretically you could. So you want to see how long people are queuing at food courts or coffee shops. 
you can see when they stand and when they shuffle forward and stand and shuffle forward and stand. And if you capture these microscopic traces from their accelerometer or barometer, you know, um, gyroscope data, you can analyze it to detect their queuing time. So similarly, we've done things for eating analytics. How long are people eating? What are they eating, et cetera, which is not the focus of today's talk. Um, so I will talk about the last one, and I'm going to get into that very shortly. So let's start with queuing, just to give you a perspective. This is work we did almost four, three years ago. So our goal was that we wanted to recognize all sorts of queuing behavior in not in very desig well designated places, but in food courts. If you go around Singapore, you can see a lot of food courts at every taxi stand, at every bus stop. We wanted to see how long people were queuing, how frequent was this activity. And so the architecture we had for that, at a high level you can think of this, that you have, at some point you have a smartphone, and on the smartphone you're running this client software, which is utilizing your inertial sensing data, in particular from the accelerometer, gyroscope, and compass. We utilize them, there's no infrastructure in these places, so we are just using the mobile sensing data. And we are trying to figure out, um, so the basic idea is this, if you just watch me, we figure out when you're stationary, then when you shuffle forward and you stand, and you shuffle forward and you stand. Now of course nobody actually cues in such military precision, so there's a lot of sort of noise elimination and smoothing, et cetera, that you have to do. I'm skipping those details. Uh, but you figure out how long a person's queuing. So when they start queuing, when they move forward, et cetera. Now you aggregate that data and you send it to the back end, and in the back end, one of the jobs is to separate out the different queues. And one reason we needed to do that is because if you go to a food court, you'll see there's like say the Thai food stall has a long queue, but next to it the chicken rice stall has a very short queue. If you want to give people the estimate of which queue is going to take how long, that's a service we wanted to build. So you open up your app, you look at it and say, oh, which stall do I go to in that food court? What is the expected queue time right now? So if I want to do that, I need to know exactly which queue people are in, and these queues are like, you know, one to two meters apart. So I can't use location tracking to disambiguate these queues, so I have to use other means, that's the disambiguation engine, and after that I aggregate the data from multiple people, from that I get both the queuing delays, the average queuing delays and the distribution, as well as the service times of the queues. And this is the schematic of our food code at SMU, and you can see that these are the queues that we build and monitor, and we can get their times. Now again, uh, in the interest of giving you a broad overview, I'm not gonna get into all the details of how this thing is done. So we had this queuing system, actually, let me go back. The, the challenge of this system was, one, it has consumes high energy. If you keep these sensors on all the time, for the three times in a day when you might queue, I'm gonna drain the battery. Also, sometimes I get a lot of false positives. You know, you're at home, and I don't know, you're shuffling forward for some strange reason that you choose to, I would think you're queuing. So I have, these have always been part of the challenges. So one of the uh, pieces of work we did in collaboration with ASTAR and uh, you know, the researchers over there, this was the notion that we wanted to build transportation analytics where we would take the transportation, everybody is doing transportation and big data. So we are borrowing from the paradigm, and Singapore is a great place to do that kind of research. We're borrowing from that, and how do I merge this participatory mobile sensing piece of model in it? So if you look at the architecture, so the architecture is think of taxis, subways, buses, they're giving data that is being collected through some system. These are independent systems, essentially. And then that data is being processed, but our contribution begins to come at this data fusion layer where we take this process data, combine it with data that we get from individual commuters who we activate the sensing on their phones to collect some data about the experience that they're having, combine that to create new types of insights. That's one of the pieces I'm talking about today. So at a high level, the paradigm is you have the transportation data. If you can intelligently combine it with modest amounts, not exorbitant amounts, but modest amounts of data that you sense from individual phones, you can discover insights that are otherwise very hard to get. And in particular, I'm giving you two examples of insights. Again, I'm curating over here, just showing two out of many. So the first one is, you know, you see all these taxis going around, and you go and wait in taxi stands. You know, yes, I know people do order online, et cetera, but people still do queue in taxi stands. So the question is, you know, I have five taxi stands around in this neighborhood. Which one should I go to? Which one has the shortest wait time, or the expected wait time? How do I quickly find that out? So the wait time of a taxi stand, you need to measure how long an individual who is 
waiting for a taxi that actually stands in that taxi stand. How long they queue and before they leave. Another example, which may be familiar to a lot of people from Asian cities, crowd, is that our subways, they've actually gotten a lot better in the last two, three years, but they used to be very crowded. And during rush hour, you can join a queue waiting to get into a train. And then it comes, the train arrives, but it's so crowded that you actually don't manage to get in. You try to get in, it's, you're jostling, and then you step back. So we're trying to quantify and measure these so-called failed boarding attempts. So both of these examples are things that you see that you can't get from the infrastructural data. You need, this is more about the individual experience of a commuter. How can we understand, is the commuter feeling frustrated? Is the commuter um, you know, um, having to wait too long for taxis? And how do we sort of do, uh, uncover these events? So little detail, again, on the taxi analytics piece. So there are, it, it's done in three phases. So one of the things, and I'll come back to the data shortly afterwards. Um, so imagine you're getting all the trip ride information, GPS coordinates of where a taxi picks up and where it drops off. You also get the status of a taxi. A stat status of a taxi in Singapore can be three, primarily, which one is green, available. Um, orange is that it's been booked. In other words, somebody has made a call for it and it's going towards their destination to pick somebody up. And the third one, it's busy. It's actually actively on the trip. So we get this three pieces of status information from every taxi. And through that, by simply geofencing and looking at deviations from the norm, <coughs> you can detect places where there is a hot spot of taxis. In other words, a lot of taxis are congregating there higher than average. So you would expect some kind of demand over there. But as this slide shows, the, blue the red line is the number of taxis, taxi hotspots, and that can be large. But not every taxi hotspot is necessarily a place where there is a queue. Because a large number of taxis arriving and just waiting, because there are, so Changi Airport, for example, to which many of you have come, if you come at midnight, there'll be a lot of taxis queuing up there. It doesn't mean that there is a queue, because there's not enough demand. They're just there waiting, anticipating for flights to come. So we somehow need to figure out from those set of hotspots the places where queuing is likely to occur. Likely, I use the phrase. And that's the blue line over time. And finally, so this was our big sort of aha moment, that we look only at those spots, and then we activate the mobile sensing pipeline only of people who are in that vicinity. So we geofence right around that taxi stands. We know where the taxi stands are. If you happen to be one of those users who's in that vicinity, then we activate the mobile sensing on your phone to see if you're actually experiencing a queue or not and to see what your queuing delay is. Okay? So, uh, little, uh, actually, I wanted to s uh, just sort of look at these two slides uh, at the bottom. So, the um, left hand side is the ground truth, and the left right hand side is our algorithm. And so, this is about 600, uh, this is about 400 seconds. So, that's about six, um, yeah, six minutes of queuing delay. And you can see our estimators are reasonably good. I mean, given the fact that we don't use any infrastructure, we don't know how many people are in the queue, and we're basically doing participatory sampling. It's not every passenger, like every commuter in the queue, we have our software running on it. We only have a very small percentage of people who actually have the software and are giving us the queuing data. So um, a little bit about the passenger queue inferencing algorithm. Again, uh, by intent, the talk is giving you a very sort of a uh, brushed overview of, of the details of the algorithm. So when do we say that a queue is likely to occur? We look for three different conditions. So the first condition is the arrival of free taxis is low and the wait time is lower than a threshold. So this indicates a low wait time. So we see that the, the, not many taxis are coming in, but when they come in, they come in green and they become red very fast and they leave. That's an indicator that there's pent up demand there so that as soon as they come in, somebody's grabbing a taxi. Similarly, you go to the other extreme where arrival of free taxis is large and the wait time is lower. Now, why these two extremes? One is the case where there really is a shortfall in supply. So, you know, very few taxis come in and people grab them. The other, interestingly, is when taxi drivers are very intelligent, they have a lot of knowledge, they're exchanging information among themselves. Wherever there are places of high demand, they instruct all their buddies to come in. So you'll see flocks of taxis <coughs> beginning to congregate in areas of high demand. So that's another reason why this is a useful signal. And finally, the last one is a large ratio of on-call taxis to free taxis. Um, so you see the orange is an on-call and the green is free. So what you see is in that, in a certain period of time, lots of taxis are coming in saying they're on-call. 
And why is this a reflection? What is this a reflection of? So this is a reflection of in the real world when passengers queue, they get frustrated, they see that the line is not moving and then they call for taxis because they have to incur extra booking charges. So this is an indicator that there is a larger number of people who are actually calling for a taxi instead of waiting in line because they see the line is too long. So all of these together give you the accurate indicator of the passenger queue inference. And finally, this is the passenger queue validation. And if you look at the numbers, they're your standard numbers. We get the queuing accuracy of how many people actually queued at over 90% accuracy. And you see the F1 scores. These are two different modes for, uh, one is for the, so just concentrate in mode A, which is the taxi queuing. Um, you see these two numbers, queuing and non-queuing, you get about 90% accuracy. Overall, the key thing that I wanted to show you through these graphs is, first, because we only trigger the sensing only when you're likely to be near a, a, a taxi stand experiencing a queuing delay, even we actually did these experiments, we sent people who spent the entire day, well, not an entire 12 hours, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., they were just standing at a taxi stand. Yeah, you, well, I mean, some of you are going, oh, I don't believe he does that to his grad students. <laughs> well, uh, don't worry, they get paid. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, they were paid volunteers. Uh, some of them were co-authors of the paper, so anything goes. Um, anyway, so the point is, um, we found that it drained only 4% of their mobile phone battery because it was only very rarely that those particular taxi stands were designated as, oh, likely to be queuing, as opposed to otherwise the battery would drain out in three hours flat. And the other point was that because we only activated it when you were in the vicinity of a queue, the false positive rate was significantly lower. Otherwise, you would think there were many more queuing episodes. So the high level message, okay, let me just con tell you about the MRT boarding analytics. This is the second piece of the work. This is the work that says, um, I want to count how often people fail to board a train. They get onto the platform and they fail to board a train. And there are three parts of it. So what we get from the government, we don't actually have the data of when a train arrives at a particular platform at a station. Now, if we had that, and I'm sure the travel, you know, the transportation agency actually has that then this problem would go away, but we don't have that. What we do have is the tap-in and tap-out data of every passenger who gets on in the trains. So we know the station where they tapped in, and we know the station where they tap out with the timestamp and the ID. So from that, we are going to try to detect when does a train arrive at a particular platform. We're gonna infer this event. After that event, we're going to, again, just like the previous one, we're gonna identify train stations that are likely experiencing large congestion. In other words, there's, I mean, the basic idea is very simple. You're seeing a lot of people trying to get into that flood station and correspondingly lower amount of people getting out of that station. That's an indicator that the queue is building up. You know, there's a high demand at that station. And finally, we're gonna do the same queue detection as before using the mobile devices of the participants to say that I'm going to count the time when you try to board a train, again, the movement of you getting in, and then you step back, and of course, I'm also able to infer when you get on a train with the initial sensors, because your mo mobility pattern is gonna become very different. Then I know you're actually on the train and moving. So I can sort of segment out the point from where you entered the platform and you started waiting to this multiple, potentially multiple attempts you need to make to board till the point you successfully boarded and the train, you were on a train. Your mobility state was now on a train. So once I have these three pieces of data, I can detect any failed boarding attempts. So just a little more detail. The ideas are very simple. So to detect a train arrival detection, we count the number of exiting passengers in each time block, and we say if the number of exiting passengers in one block versus the previous block shows a sudden surge, then we think that a train just arrived. Because the hypothesis is if a train arrived and passengers disembarked, then you should see a large surge in the number of people tapping out at that station. So it's just a simple idea. And of course, there is a little bit more statistical refinement on it, but broadly speaking, this works. And so all those red dots, you see this is the peak. The red dots represent the ground truths of when a train arrived at a particular platform. So this is the visual capture. And you can see that um, you know there are some peaks over here that are not quite no, no train arrival, but for the most part, this algorithm works. It kind of detects the peak. 
there is a peak here, that's a false positive. There was actually no train there. So people just left later on after d disembarking. Now, finally, after this process, and I, I think you know this is not a little bit fuzzy in terms of not focused. So the false boarding train detection method has a precision of 95% a recall of 88, which means that we have fewer false positives, some false negatives. We miss a few failed boarding attempts. And overall, you know, we're able to detect this very isolated, this is not a commonplace event every day, but when it happens, we're able to isolate this and quantify this, that how many passengers, what fraction of passengers get onto platforms at different stations and are unable to board trains, which is a source of frustration. So I'm going to stop here on this part of the talk uh, because I want to sort of summar summarize, and you know, I could go on in more details about this, but what this illustrates <coughs> is the possibility of taking the transportation data and combining it with very modest amounts of participatory sensing data. This is the tagline that I want to say. When you combine them, you can get new types of insights that you can't get from each individual uh, data stream or sensor stream. And in particular, you can't rely on mobile sensing to be universal because it is expensive in energy and it is also very noisy. So you have to use this filtering, two-stage filtering process to improve the accuracy of your system. Okay, so to the second part of my talk, and how am I doing in time? How much? That's perfect. I have about 30 minutes yes. left? Okay, so this is perfect. So this is the second <coughs> half of the talk. And the second half of the talk, I want to tell you, you know, uh, this, this is a conscious choice. A lot of the things I'm talking about are early stage results. These are not results that have even been published in a lot of papers. And I want to do that in the spirit of having a discussion with a lot of the audience. As opposed to sometimes, you know, you have keynotes which are more retrospective. I said, yeah, I did this work 10 years ago, and everybody's worked on it, and now what? So I think this is more in the spirit of some of you, if you're interested, to see you know, the possibilities around this. So the vision that I say socio-physical, this is a term we coined. Um, what does it mean? So it means we have social media data. This is the data from Twitter, Instagram, Facebook check-ins, etc. People are doing these. Some of these are publicly available through various APIs. You can harvest that data set. And then comes the physical part. So again, if you look at these sensors, so what Singapore is doing, I don't know if how many of you are aware of it, there is a website called data.gov.sg, data.gov.sg. This is called the Data Mall of Singapore, and the government has been doing amazing things. It's making more and more data sets publicly available through APIs, and we're not the only city doing this. Amsterdam, as I know, done it. Um, I mean, London does a little bit of this as well. Um, I think, I, I'm not quite sure, but wasn't Santander, Santander supposed to be doing a lot of this kind of work as well? So, um, you know, we're very much in the spirit of releasing urban data, and it's not just transportation data. You'll get data of electricity consumption, you'll get census data, you'll get data of, you know, um, various other kinds of, you know, water resources and so on. And you can begin to fuse them in interesting ways. So in, in particular, the diagram here says there's infrastructure sensors, and these are sensors um, that in, in this particular talk, I'm talking of sensors on buses, on taxis and parking garages and traffic cameras. So these are the kind of sensors we're talking about. Combining them with mobile sensors and the social sensor. You know, your Facebook, your LinkedIn, whatever you want to. What my end vision is, I want to use all of these. My view is, these are probes in the city. Now in the city, stuff happens. Stuff happens all the time. So one of the stuff that could be happening today is that there's a little conference being held here. How can I detect micro events like this with some certainty detect and annotate such micro events going on in the city. Now the use cases for this I'll come to later, which there are use cases in urban planning, there's use cases obviously for civil defense and security, but there's other use cases for private intelligence and analytics we're working on, which I will show you right in the last slide. But this is the big picture. I believe, so imagine for example, I mean, let me set this up, so what happens Suppose many of you have kids, your kids go to a neighborhood school, and the school finishes at 3.30. Now today you have a parents teachers meeting or you have some kind of after school concert, and you know, the concert continues to 4.15. My hypothesis is that this event actually causes a perturbation in the pattern of various kinds of transportation data that we get. So in other words, the buses 
which used to get occupied and wait at that bus stop at 3.30, today might see the occupancy shift to 4.15. The parking garages might see getting filled up around 3.15, all the parents come in in the vicinity, and they might see them being emptied out at 4.30, which they don't on a normal day. Or you might see a larger demand in taxis coming into that place, and they start a trip from there around the vicinity. So all of these are indicators that there's something unusual going on. And that's what we're trying to distill out. So you can see this is a classic inverse estimation problem. Tremendous amount of noise. And we're trying to see how far we can get by filtering out this noise as possible. So I hopefully have set the context for this. Uh, so, so far, our goal is to get to micro events. And so far, we've been spectacularly far from that goal. What we've been doing is looking at macro <coughs> events. These are events for which you don't need this kind of analytics but we're using them to understand the properties that we're looking for. So the classic one, this is the F1 race. Some of you may be enthusiastic. The data we're actually using is not for 2017. This is a year ago from 2016. So the roads would be blocked. You see all the roads that are being blocked. This is an unusual day in the city. What is interesting is you'll have these crowds coming in to see, and they come in at, from different vantage points in the city. And you'll see taxis suddenly becoming free. You see them switch from red to green at certain points in the city at certain times and in an unusually large number uh, at those points. And then you begin to see people tweeting. You know, if Hamilton would get out of his car and f finish the race running, he'd probably still win. And that's probably even true this year. Uh, now, um, if you haven't followed, if you're not an F1 enthusiast, Singapore had one of the craziest races this year. Uh, you know, you had the top contender crash out of the race in the first minute. So you can go Google that and sort of see how interesting that was. So let's get a little more technical. What is the big picture pipeline we're going after? So I want to start, and there's a lot of people working on this, and I'm not the expert in it. So if you look at social media mining, which a lot of people have been doing, they look at all these public feeds, they first analyze for relevancy, and they look for credibility. There's a big piece of work going on in social media I'm filtering out so-called the topic du jour, right? Fake news. How do you filter out fake news? So there's a lot of work going on in that. And then you detect topics. So you have this fire hose of social media events. You identify various trending events and so on. So all of this other people are working on. Where we are going is we have all this urban informatics data, say bus arrivals, taxi trips. Um, telcos give us data, uh, footfalls. So again, you can go look at something called Spark which is the API from Singtel, where they give you aggregated data for, um, you know, from, from call, call records, like what is the occupancy in different places, how long are people residing in different sections, et cetera. So you can take that, you can do occupancy detection, for example. You can do various kinds of feature extraction. After you extract features, you can model what's normal. So you do classic supervised learning. You know this is between 4 to 5 p.m. on Mondays. This is how many people you would expect normally. And then you begin to look for anomalies from that. You look for deviations from that. And you feed that in. You combine the two. The big innovation is you combine these two feeds to better localize events. Because each one is a very coarse-grained location estimator. You'll see some examples afterwards. And one of my hopes, which we haven't done again, is eventually you don't just localize and say something unusual going on there. By analyzing the social media feeds, maybe some keywords come out and you say, Oh, it's the parents' teacher's concert today at that school. That's what's going on for this duration. Because maybe kids, you know, my son or daughter got an F. I mean, I got a really yell at the <coughs> teacher. So it, I mean, all of that carries some semantic meaning that you're going for an interaction with the teacher. So this, this is the architectural overview of what we're trying to do. I'm not going to, this is not an eye chart. I'm not asking you to spend tons of time on it. This is just an illustration. These are all the different types of data sets that we've been working with. Right now, we have 70 cameras. Uh, we have 5,000 bus stops island-wide, and we get data. So there's some interesting pieces over here. For various reasons, and I guess a lot of it for security and anonymity, the, the, the Land Transport Authority, the data that they're releasing to us tells us the timestamp, the bus ID, the lat long. Bus ID meaning which bus service, bus number 10, bus number 12, et cetera. It does not tell us the specific bus instance. So it doesn't say this is bus one of bu route 12 and this is bus two. So I'll show how we infer that in a short bit. 
We get car park availability right now. This can expand. I mean, we're in the process of expanding the crawling around this. You, you have taxis, and we've looked at two different data sets. So taxis you have in Singapore, you get the free taxi data set. We've also, just to test out our methods, we work with New York taxi, New York City taxi data sets, which actually give you the trip destination and source for every trip. So they, there's a richer set of information over there. Well, again, you know, details, you can come and talk to me afterwards. Uh, we've also been crawling uh, sort of Foursquare and Twitter data for now. Um, I did not put over here because that work is ongoing and I'm not ready to talk about it. We actually have also Instagram data. Um, the reason Instagram data is very interesting in, in any of you want to work in that space. Um, pictures, they say tell a thousand words. They actually tell lots of interesting stuff. If you, with the recent advance in sort of the deep learning understanding of images, you can now extract so much detail from just regular pictures that people are posting about themselves, you know, just selfies, and there's background information about how crowded a place is, how noisy, you know, things like that. So there's a very fertile field of work going on around extracting event information from those as well. So that's the background, okay? So what are the challenges? So I'm gonna just try to synthesize this for now. So the first challenge is, you have all these transportation events. We see a taxi pickup, taxi drop off. It's very noisy. So how do I recover and identify concrete pieces of information? So in particular, the example, and again, I'm deliberately picking one example of each, just to give you a flavor. So the example is, we said the SG bus data, it has the GPS and the timestamp, but it has no bus ID on it. One of the things we are trying to do is, we are trying to identify, oh, this is the bus, this is the bus stop, as it crossed this bus stop, I want to see how many people got off the bus, how many people got on the bus. That to me is an indicator of potential footfall, egress or ingress at that location. But they don't tell us when you arrive at a bus stop. They're just giving us GPS coordinates every two minutes. So you'll see one of the challenges with that. Now, I'm getting data from a bunch of different sources, right? You're getting data from the images. The images come once every three minutes. The bus stops. Bus data comes once every two minutes. So it's relatively fine grained. You get exact GPS coordinates. But guess what? The bus only travels along certain routes. So it's essentially, if you think of space, it's sampling the space only in specific directions. Whereas taxis, they embark and disembark people of, you know, all over the place. So the taxi spatial resolution is much more homogeneous as opposed to um, bus routes. And taxis give you more frequent data. But on the other hand, taxis don't tell us how many people got on the taxi. So we have no way of knowing if one taxi is taking one person or five people. So there are all these trade-offs in the different data sources. And the final question is, how do I spatially, temporarily localize the event? So hold on, you might wonder what this question is. I'll give you an example shortly. So let's, again, in the interest of briefly touching each of these topics, let's talk about cleaning the noisy data. Why is this an interesting research problem? So what you get in Singapore is every two minutes, a bus stop here, so you see a bus stop here, and this is the next bus stop. You will get the GPS coordinate of the next bus that is to arrive there. And you will also separately get the GPS coordinates of the subsequent bus that will arrive there. They're going to tell you this for, say, bus number 10. This is the GPS coordinate of the next bus, this is the GPS coordinate of the subsequent bus. So think about how we look at this. So suppose this, the blue line is the next bus from this first bus stop. Now what you see is the red for this one because this, this is also the next bus for this bus stop. So both of them are repeat, giving you the same GPS coordinates. I don't know which bus it is, no bus ID. Two different data sets are both telling me bus stop one, next bus is here, bus stop two, next bus also here. And at the same time, it's saying the subsequent bus for bus stop one is here, subsequent bus for bus stop two is here. If I can look at that, I say, oh, they're both the same bus. So the data would look something like this. In the next instance of data, you get this piece of data. Again, next instance of data, you get this piece, right? Now what happens? Look at what happened over here. So that single bus actually crossed bus stop one and is en route to bus stop two. So the next bus data for bus stop two, this bus, it's still the same bus, it has moved on. Whereas the next bus for bus stop one has now, it's this bus that has hopped on to become next bus here. So these two are aligning now. 
I hope it's not too complicated to follow. You can logically reason that it's the next bus has become this, the current bus. Whereas for this bus stop, yet another bus has become this next to next bus here. So suddenly you no longer have the synchronization. Now, then they move like this. So our job is to recover which bus moved in what time and location, each individual bus. Now this seems like a fairly trivial problem when I describe it. So here are some challenges in the practical world. I'm not listed all of them. First one, some buses just skip bus stops. If nobody's waiting and nobody presses the bell to get down, they just cross over. And in two minutes, it can cross multiple bus stops. And then I don't know where people disembarked and embarked when I see a change in occupancy. The next thing is buses overtake each other. I had this very nice model that a bus is going in tandem and therefore I can correlate each bus. But buses overtake each other, so the whole sequencing uh, pattern gets destroyed. Now, the last one, which is sort of devilish in its detail. Now, you can understand for operational reasons why you know, the, the bus operator does this. And actually, right near our school, which is in the city bus, they'll have, say, a bus stop, a bus service is from Changi to Jurong, so from the east side to the west side. They have some buses occasionally waiting in the city center, and they just activate at certain peaks demands, and they start from the middle. So all of a sudden, I have this extra piece of data just pop up that I have not seen at any of the previous bus stops. And I don't have the predictability to understand where they come from. So what is our goal is to take all these different tokens and separate them out. So you plot them out. So you see some blues and some reds. So I, my job is to say all the reds belong to one bus. All the blues belong to another instance of a bus. I'm not going to know exactly what the bus ID is. It doesn't matter. I'm going to say they're distinct buses because then I can track them separately. So this is at some level of spatiotemporal clustering problem. And how do we do it? So our goal is, so here is what we do. For each bus service, actually let me illustrate to you this. So at each bus service, I first separate out what I call snippets. <coughs> so a snippet is if I look at next bus, I'm at this bus stop. I see, oh, it's over there, then it's next over here, next over here, and then it jumps back because that's the next bus. So I say, oh, this is a snippet. This could belong to one bus because it has a contiguous motion. So there are two snippets over here. Now, when I look at these two snippets, I see some of these overlap because they are both referring to the same bus instance. So my job is to stitch together these snippets when I use k common tuples. Each of these are common tuples between you know, space, time, location. Now, I want to stitch them together, and there are some feasibility conditions, and then I create this whole thing. I say, oh, all of this data is basically one bus, and this is the location trajectory of the bus. That's the goal. Now, if you have hundreds of these buses across hundreds of different pathways, this quickly becomes a sort of spatiotemporal data mining problem. I'm not getting into the algorithm for this. I mean, clearly not the space to do that today. But you can see this is an interesting problem that you apply the analytics and you separate it out. And we've been actually fairly successful in doing that. We get accuracies of about, I mean, when we test it with ground truth data that we collect, we get accuracies in the order of 94 to 95% of being able to recover the exact buses. So yes, we still have noise. So here, for example, is a stitched together itinerary. This starts from Tampines, it goes along this path, and each of these colors is a different snippet. We have just stitched them together to say they all belong to one bus. When you have cleaned the data this way, now you can go in for the next phase of analytics. So here again, I go back to the Singapore Grand Prix. I'm just giving you, we have done this for many events. The point is not to just exhaustively enumerate all of them. So what happened, this is not this year, last year. So there was race day and practice days, two days before that. Well, what happened is that the bus, the routes, because Singapore has a road race, if you're not familiar. So what they do is they close the roads for two days even before and a day after. So you're going to see disruptions in patterns last longer than the actual event. So this, as I said, this is five, six different days that I'm looking for. Now, if you look, again, I'm just illustrating some points. Here are some outlier scores for F1-related tweets. These are tweets that we do topic mining and re relate to, to F1. So the zero that you see over here is when the actual race starts on race day. And what you can see is that the peak of the tweets actually happens about an hour before because people are all excited hey you're going over you want to see this etc so if i'm trying to localize the event this is just an illustration that peaks 
This is like impulse response of a filter. The peak doesn't correspond to the start of the event. This is an, in advance of the event, there is a peak. And there'll be an, a peak potentially after the event. Now this is for social media data. So again, cutting through a lot of details, here is what I wanted to show you, and let me take some time. We had six days, I'm showing the recall, which means that the ability of each different sensing mode to identify an anomaly on those six days. So if it identified on all six days, the recall would be one. If it identified on only one day, the recall would be 0.16. So the lines you see here, the red is streets on the circuit. Now this is using um, taxi data. So using the streets which are on the circuit, they're closed for all six days. So you see an anomaly, no taxi drops off or picks up. That's easy, 100% recall. And the x-axis is the distance from the event center. Where the actual event happened, the x-axis is the distance. What you see is there is actually a good recall for even on neighboring streets. So even streets that were not blocked, but where the traffic began to get uh, distorted because these streets were blocked, you begin to see anomalies based on the taxi data. The traffic camera data, of course, can only pick up, it's actually hidden over here. It's close by, it only detects the anomaly in three, um, actually two out of the six days. Uh, wait. Um, it should be at point 0.5, three out of the six days. And similarly, tweets only detect the anomaly on two out of the six days, the race day and the day before. So each sensor, my point is, is not by itself, is foolproof. It's not able to isolate the event. And that suggests that we need to synthesize or fuse these events. So here is a methodology that we're following for event localizing. Now we're trying to find out where the event is. So first we compute for any kind of data, whether bus, taxi arrival, whatever, you compute the expected occupancy. We bin it, each region or grid, time of the day, day of the week. So each one has a bin. Then you take the test data, and we've experimented with a few outlier uh, measures. So far, the most robust has been trying to model it as a normal distribution and compute the z-score. So you just compute how many standard deviations away today's data is from the north. So you assign a z-score to each bin, and then, for now, the criteria we're having, we still haven't solved the localization problem. So we basically say if around this event, an n number of blocks within distance r, and I can set n to be one, two, three, they have an outlier score greater than something, then I say within a certain time window of the start time, I say I've identified that event. Otherwise, I've failed to identify the event. This is the definition I'm giving. So of course, if I increase t, my event detection improves because I'm allowing a wider window. If I increase r, I'm allowing greater laxity in my, I'm reducing the accuracy of my localization. I'll still be able to detect the event. So here are some results that we wanted to show, and this is not from F1, but this is, you can uh, make how well it's written over there. This is uh, from earlier this year, a Britney Spears concert. This is another illustration of something, and each of the individual systems, see this is where the true event actually happened, but four squared localized it over here. The bus anomalies localized here. The CDR, or the cellular data records from uh, transportation, uh, from the cellular network company, localized over here. So the thing you can see is each one is close by, but they all seem to have different errors in different directions. And so far, we have been unable to systematically find a fusion algorithm to combine these errors. And that's work in progress. And of course, to just to give you the idea that if once I identify this region, and then I do a geofencing of the tweets in that region, sure enough, Britney Spears as a topic shows up. So that illustrates that I'd be able to find and explain the event, annotate the event, if my localization was correct. So here is another piece of data um, from localization from New York taxi data. So we looked at about 160 events, seven parades, and we left out the parades. The problem with the parade is, especially if you know the Fifth Avenue parade, what's the center of the event? I don't know, because it's like a you know, five mile long event. Where do I declare that it's this is the right center? So we looked more at things like fairs, concerts, you know, things like that, which have a very well-defined center. And these are the ground truth event locations. These are the various four square venues. Um, from the taxi drop-off data, we were able to identify and isolate these events. That's the key point that I wanted to say. 
Um, I'm not getting into a lot of detail in the interest of time. I wanted to time this properly. So the idea was, we know where the events were. We looked at the taxi drop-off data, we looked at the anomalies, and we were able to identify a large percentage of these events. Now, what we haven't done is these, the detection logic also depends on the type of location it's happening. Is it downtown, residential, industrial use, et cetera? Because they all have very different arrival departure patterns. So that's something we're looking at. How do you refine the event detection logic to take into account the nature, the physical nature of the space uh, where those events are happening. So here is an example of the localization study for taxis and Foursquare. So what you see is x-axis is the distance threshold. How far from actual event did it occur? These are over all those 69 events. This is the recall. And what you can see is Foursquare in 2013, when Foursquare is still very popular. It's, it's unfortunately not right now. So, you can see this is the CDF of the recall. So you can see 80% of the events are done within a one and a half kilometers of the location. So that's 1,500 meters. Now, how many hours prior to the start of the event? So drop off, prior to the start of the event, drop off has better recall than pickup. So I'm, I'm just, you can just see what's going to happen here. This is at the start of the event. Drop off still better than pickup. After the event, pickups are better than drop offs. Quite obvious, right? Because now people are leaving the event. Now they're getting picked up and they're leaving. So you can see the sequence as I go through. Social media is better than the taxi information. But different taxi events, when you look at their de deviations, you can identify the start and the end of an event. Because start is manifested by an anomaly in drop offs. End is manifested as an anomaly in pickups from that location. So these are the kinds of distinctions that we can draw from the graphs. And of course, the event recall drops with increasing end. If I say, oh, so many regions around me have to be anomalous, and if I increase that value of end, then I will miss events. So I will decrease the recall, but I will increase the precision. Because in other words, I'll you know, not have so many false <coughs> positives in the process. So we've been fine tuning these algorithms. So you can play with different values over here. And again, I, I don't want to get in, you know, this is one set of events from one city. We've been looking at the similar thing in Singapore, and we've been trying to uncover the robust algorithm that detects these events at different places. But what we see right now is we get within one to two kilometers of the venue. That's not such a great result. I mean, come to think of it, two kilometer radius of error isn't fantastic yet. But I wanted to point out that we haven't done we haven't done the fusion yet. These are all individual pieces of data. My hypothesis and claim is uh, when we begin to fuse in the taxi data, when we begin to fuse in the, the traffic camera data, when we begin to fuse in the car garage occupancy data, each of them will sort of, they, I, I expect the errors to be orthogonal independent. So the more you fuse them, the errors should come down. And that's actually work that's in progress. So here is an example from car, car park data. I mean, this is data from a parking garage. SunTech, which you might know is a big uh, convention center over here. The blue line is the occupancy of the garage occupancy. And the, it's, yeah. And then the red dots and orange dots, so the way you interpret this, this is over a period of days in the month of August this year. So these were various events that we know happened at SunTech. These were the F1 races. This was a GovWare, which is a major, um, uh, an IT show happening at these events. So what you can see is, you look at the Z-scores, the red Z-scores are either higher or lower. So naturally, the lower Z-scores mean that the parking garages got really full during those times. This is the availability graph, so the availability is low, means the garage was full. And what you can see is the precision in this case, actually just for parking garage data, precision is astoundingly high almost close to one. Every time parking garage says there's an anomaly, sure enough, there's an event over there. But sometimes the recall is we haven't figured that out. Some events we're unable to detect because a lot of people don't come by cars, don't park their cars, etc. So um, what I want to do, uh, just show in this graph is, so this was the Britney Spears event that we talked about, but our algorithms found a bunch of other events. And then we looked at it, and we said there were other events going on, but these are unknown events. In other words, we didn't prime the system to look for these events. The system <coughs> detected these other events. 
So this kind of validates and shows the power of these processes, uh, but of course there's still a lot of work to be done. So my conclusion for all the research that I was wanting, that I presented to you folks today. So yes, vehicular data, you guys have been doing a lot of work looking at networking aspects and how to coordinate vehicle vehicle networks. I'm looking at it as a mobility trace, and it can help us detect high and low intensity urban events. And the key things that we're doing is, it's not about just cleaning the data, and it's not about fusing with social media analytics. It's the ability to combine all these disparate pieces of anomalies and being able to reason about them in a systematic way so that you improve the localization accuracy. So I think the big area for us is the event localization. We want to get more precise. And you can think of these graphs as multi-layer network graphs. One thing we have not done, or I mean, we are actually doing, I'm not, again, ready to talk about it publicly. When you think of the anomalies, right now we think each region in isolation. but these anomalies are actually happening over a network graph. This graph is a graph of the connectivity of the city over the road network. So we can begin to apply more of graph-based analytics to realize that, oh, an anomaly here cascades over here because these are connected on the same road. So that's the kind of analytics that's very promising that our students are doing right now. Uh, one last slide, which is not connected to the theme of my talk, but in the spirit of having a discussion or sharing some uh, you know, possibilities with you. So I think wherever, which, whichever city you come from, there should be a movement, and Singapore really is very laudable in this, to make more and more of the city data public. So what happened in Singapore was there's a service called Beeline.sg, it's a website where people could submit their request for a new bus service. This was new request for bus service saying, hey, I want a bus from my home to my office. And you could aggregate that, and the government did the analytics on this data. And the government exposed this by APIs to private operators. And Grab, which is like the big, big like Uber, they actually run an on-demand shuttle service by using the analytics on this data. That's how they set their routes. So this is a clear case of transportation optimization. However, the second case is actually the more interesting. And this is where I'll stop. The third one is not so relevant for this, this audience. So you tend to think, OK, he's talking about all this transportation data and all of this. So it's going to be used for better optimized transportation. Not quite so. So here is an example of something we're just early stage of working in. So imagine you have all of the work that I was showing, the bus, the taxi, the Facebook check-ins. So we are able to predict crowds. We're able to estimate the crowds in particular neighborhoods and locations. Now, we're also able to estimate where these people have been, and we can track them in some cases for social media. When you combine that with a restaurant aggregator, who is looking at booking patterns across a variety of restaurants. How many people have booked? What kind of meals do they order? He has all this data. When you combine this analytics, you have the opportunity to tell the restaurants now, today in the next two hours, I expect you're going to see a 20% bump in your restaurant demand. And again, in the specific type of restaurant, because you can see from what demographics people are coming, what neighborhoods they're coming. And they can use this also to give personalized recommendations to the citizens of the city. Because I anticipate today there will be a big demand for chicken rice, so you might want to steer yourself to a different type of restaurant. So the centerpiece of my thought process here is that we look at all this urban data, and we typically tend to think, oh, it's going to be used for smart city operations. But I think there is an equally valid argument to be made and an opportunity to take this analytics, extract it, and utilize it for private businesses and private enterprise, you know, doing better prediction of demand, better customization and recommendations. And all of this can only happen if cities offer platforms where they can collect this data and they can release it in a safe, aggregated. See, none of this needs individual data. So privacy, which I'm sure some of you may have added this question, is not in, not in play here because I don't need to know any of the individuals uh, providing the data. I just need the aggregated demand and pattern to provide this kind of service. So with that, I think I've exhausted my time, and I've exhausted your patience and your ability to process information in the day of Facebook and Twitter. I could tweet out my keynote next time. I'll try that. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. All right, thanks very much. So I will be um, facilitating a short Q&A session. So I will be running with the microphone. So any questions for? Professor Misra, please raise your hands. We have one here. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, first, uh, thanks. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the interesting talk. Uh, a lot of facts that I didn't know, for example, what uh, amount of data is uh, actually currently now made publicly available. Um, so this would be my first question. Um, is it always a good idea to make this uh, data available? I think from a technical perspective, what we can gather out of this data is amazing. But um, I think there are also some security slash safety risks associated with this data. For example, um, if I'm a pickpocket, I could use it to <laughs> make out the, the best spots where I can find tourists or maybe uh, locate areas where the police takes longer to reach the area if I want to commit a crime, if I want to well, maybe terrorists, something like that. Um, is this also part of your research or, or the, the research community? Or is it just out of scope? Uh, so it's, it's not part of my research, but it's definitely part of the research of the research community. And I think there's a very strong, compelling argument, and that is why the government doesn't release a lot of this data. So there's some classic sort of bad actor scenarios, right? So one of those is, you know, if you're a bad actor and you, know, you want to set up an explosive device, you will know exactly the place with the highest occupancy of people in which shopping mall at one point, et cetera. So uh, I, I think that those are very legitimate concerns, and the way the data is exposed, so even the data the got that when I say it's public, it's not like you go in and you just extract the data. So you have to go in with your corporate identifier, you know, you have to identify yourself, you have to agree to terms of service and then download the data. However, that does, I mean, the fact that the data is public means that everybody here is getting access to it and somebody with a malicious intent will use it maliciously. So you mentioned something, again, many of you may be aware. <coughs> I think it was last year, I forget the dates. There's an article in The Economist. So you know, um, you were mentioning the pickpockets and they can identify. So I think it was the London um, tube data that they were able, I, I may be getting the facts wrong of the exact location. So looking at the tap in and tap out, which is the same data, you know, you tap in and you tap out. So the London tube, they showed that you could actually identify the pickpockets. It was a reverse problem because they were taking the paths, they would stay in the subway system for longer and they would take counterintuitive, they wouldn't take the shortest path because if, you th if you're a pickpocket, your goal is to stay in the tube for the longest amount of time, not tra traverse the system and leave the system. So if you see that pattern of usage of a certain card, then you can identify that person. Now, once this data becomes public, the pickpocket is gonna get smarter. He's gonna use a different card each time because he's not, till that point, the pickpocket was oblivious. He was going about tapping in, tapping out, using his Oyster card every day. So I do think like all security, there's an arms race around this possibility. Um, so there is definitely a, a to your broader point, yes, there is a concern about public release of the data. Good, we have room for two or three more questions. Fabian. Thank you again for an interesting talk. Um, I was wondering if your research also includes um, getting information about the type of audience uh, that gathered at certain events. So for example, maybe if students visit an event, they tend to take the bus, or if people visit the opera, they tend to take taxis. Is, is that part of your, your research? Short answer, yes. Uh, well, I think that answers the question. <laughs> the answer is yes, we don't have conclusive results. But let me just extrapolate. So there's two ways to get students <laughs> and stuff like that. So one is you look at the social media. They have profiles. You know, you, you can sort of correlate that. And in fact, one of the pieces of work we're doing right now is exactly that. We're looking at taxi demand, and we're trying to correlate it at movie theaters, where we know the movie programs. We're trying to correlate it to build better correlations with the type of movies being shown. So if it's like a children's movie, the odds are that a lot more parents are coming in a cab, bringing their kids over. Uh, whereas, you know, whatever, if it's like a teenage or whatever, young couple's movie, they might come on a bus in Singapore. So uh, a lot of this is building the statistical correlation models to, and to identify what those covariates are. So um, it's not just me, there's a, a research community out there that is looking to build what is what I've is more demographically driven models of the correlation between events and artifacts. Yes. Good, so one or two more questions. We have one here. Thank you, Professor Misha. So what, whatever I have understood, you have actually blended transportation data with uh, personal mobile data to detect some events ongoing. My question is related to, can you predict an event which is coming? And in case you could do that, 
do you need any more data in addition to transportation data and personal mobile data? Okay. So thank you for asking. I think that is a great question. As before, I mean, the disappointing answer is it's work in progress, so I can't. But let me give you the idea, and I'll try to hand wave over here. So first to the prediction. So imagine you have three bus routes, and they come from different parts of the city, but they come together in one common portion, and then they separate out. If today, all those three bus routes, I see a higher percentage of people getting on the bus, an abnormal increase in demand as people get on the bus, at those three points, far to the west. Logically, you could argue that those three bus lines will intersect at the common point 30 minutes from now, because that's the commuting time. I, why are these three lines seeing demand simultaneously? Maybe because there's an event at the common intersecting point. So now I'm able to predict an event 30 minutes in advance of it actually happening. Do you follow? So there is a little bit of a causation type uh, time-lapse analysis that we, we are actually looking at. Now, when you combine that, if you have the data of the profile of the people who are getting on, so if it's students who go to a rock concert, and you know that's the incident that you're beginning to see and all, then you begin to get more intelligent. You know, maybe there's a rock concert happening, right? So this is just a hypothesis right now we're working on. I don't have a conclusive answer to this, but I think it gives you the sense of where the direction in which we're going. Um, to HRE, ECU, right? Um, this is a binary question to quite a binary answer. Um, so, in those unknown system generated anomalies, were you able to go back, traverse back, and see what, how, and why the systems generated them? That's one question. Second part is are you by any chance treating the data that is generating as a time, ge that is generated as a time series data, that is, each event is correlated with the previous one? Uh, can you expand on the second one? Because uh, the first one I can answer binarily. Um, when you say correlate each event with the previous one. For example, somebody stepped into a subway. That's an event. So before they entered into the subway, they reached a certain spot. And before that, they reached in that spot, they reached another spot, which was actually a predecessor to that. But it had the multiple you know, possibilities at the step. You know, the first step I talked about. Got it. Got it. So, a non binary answer to your first question yes, uh, in some cases. In some cases, we are able to go back and explain the anomaly. So, even for example, I was talking about the parking garage. So, we see an event happening at 8 a.m. tomorrow, and we saw the anomaly at midnight in the parking garage. We were like, what's happening? And it turned out that event had a lot of prep work that needed to be done. So the event organizers actually came in overnight. And when we talked with the, the um, corresponding like SunTech, then we were able to tease that out. So we can explain or understand some of these. Some of these we can't. To your second question, we are not at the phase. I think that's, an, again, an excellent idea. See, we don't have a lot of personal data in, in everything I described. So I really don't have instances where I know a person went to a bank who drew money, after that went to a food court, ate, and then is getting on a bus, things like that. Uh, but I think the broader intent of your question is, uh, you know, right now we are treating these as IID events. We are tr treating them, I mean, that's exactly what we're following. Over time, you begin to, you can think of these as Markovian chains or whatever, to say, oh, there was a spike in, you know, the movie ended, then there was a spike in restaurant demand. After the restaurant demand, then there is a spike in coffee shop demand. Because you know, there is a certain activity sequence that people are following that can potentially explain some of these anomalies as a, as a, as a chain reaction of anomalies that are occurring. Uh, we haven't done that yet. I mean, we're very far. Uh, we're still grappling with the sort of noisy data. I think that's a very worthwhile direction to pursue. We haven't gotten that. We have time for one more question, and I will have to draw a line. So feel free to take the chance before we. Okay, nobody. You might be around a little bit afterwards. So please join me in thanking Professor Mister once again for this wonderful. <laughs>